My name is Mike Nelson. Although I spend the majority of my time on dry land, I make most of my living anywhere from 10 to, oh, 200 feet underwater. Alardi Alardi is a little fish of the Triacanthidae family. It's only about, uh, oh, five and a half inches long, but, well, it's important enough for marine land to send me halfway around the world in search of some living specimens. Alardia lives in the deep waters of the West Indies. And from 1861 to 1925, there was only one in captivity. And it was my job to secure a new supply. It was time for a break, so I stood for the surface to replenish my air supply. At that same moment, more than a thousand miles away, a test missile was heading for the ionosphere at about 18,000 miles an hour. There seems little connection between an ICBM streaking through the sky and a little fish with a big name on the floor of the Caribbean. But the connection that developed put me in a very tight spot. A very tight spot. It was just about 26 hours later that things began to happen. Mike Nelson? Yeah, that's right. I'd like to see you for a minute. Okay, come on aboard. Thanks. We, uh, we know another? Well, my name's John Sumner. You've uh, worked for my firm before. Oh, yeah. A little project called uh, World War Number Two. Mike, tell me, what do you know about rockets and missiles? Rockets and missiles? Well, only when I read in the papers, pick up here and there. If I start talking about the nose cone of a rocket, you know what I mean? Oh, it's the business end of the rocket, isn't it? That's right. Well, we fired an experimental missile yesterday to test our progress in the development of a nose cone that will survive the plunge back through the Earth's atmosphere, you know, after the rocket's spent. Well, as you probably know, the friction from such a plunge generates enough heat to disintegrate most objects before they strike the Earth. You know, like the media. Uh-huh. Well, we think we have a metal that will not only survive the heat, but has enough resistance to protect the internal mechanism. You know, keep it intact and operating. But there's only one problem. Oh, uh, what's that? We have to recover the nose cone to find out. And it didn't land where it was supposed to. Well, uh, do you know where it did fall? According to our tracking device, it landed within a few square miles of where we are right now, at the bottom of the ocean. Oh. Yeah, but uh, a couple of miles, that's, uh, that's a, lot of, a lot of space in the ocean. I know. It's a tough job, but I've heard if anybody can do it, you can. Oh, our Navy uh, much better equipped for that kind of a job than I am. Well, territorial waters could be involved. See, the Navy can't go poking its nose into some other nation's backyard. Yeah, I know. Isn't it possible that somebody around here saw it fall? There's a possibility. And that possibility puts even more pressure on us. That nose cone mustn't fall in the wrong hands. Well, how about it, Mike? We in business? Well, I need help. Somebody that I can trust. And uh, well, I need more equipment. Well, we've anticipated all the problems. You'll be on the pier tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. Someone will contact you. OK? OK. Next morning, I was on the pier on schedule, waiting for my contact to make himself known. Who would it be? It could be any of these people. I felt that it would be a surprise. It was. Hello. Are you Mike Nelson? Yeah. You're a hard man to find. I've been looking all over for you this morning. I'm Kathy Morton. How do you do, Miss Norton? I've been studying photography, and I want to do some underwater pictures. I'll need some expert advice and assistance. Well, I'm sorry, Miss Norton. I, I, I'd really love to help you, but uh, I'm working on an assignment for Marine Land of the Pacific, and it's a full-time job. 
But my work's really quite good, Mr. Nelson. As a matter of fact, I have a little picture here I'm rather proud of. Took it about two years ago. Yeah, this is a nice shot there, Miss Norton. Shows good technique. I was hoping you'd feel that way. But you know, uh, you could have all kinds of possibilities as a photographer and still not be able to shoot good pictures underwater. It calls for a special kind of experience. Underwater. I think I've had enough experience to get by. How about equipment? What would I need? Uh, there are certain items. Listen, why don't we get out of my boat, huh? I'll see what I have in hand. Fine. Our meeting on the pier was kind of on the cloak and dagger side, don't you think? Well, it'll tell a lot of people that I've hired you to teach me to take underwater pictures. Yeah, you even have an underwater camera. Prove it, huh? Does look like a camera, doesn't it? What do you mean, isn't it? There's a pulsating device in that nose cone we're looking for. If the nose cone survived the heat, it'll send out a signal. That's actually a receiving set to pick up the signals. Oh, what do you know? Hey, those, uh, the signals from the nose cone, how far do they carry underwater? Oh, anywhere from a few hundred yards to a quarter of a mile. Depending on the conditions, huh? Mm hmm When we get within range, it'll tick like a Geiger counter. The closer we get to the nose cone, the louder that ticking. You sure throw me a curve, you know that? Oh? Yeah. I, uh, I didn't expect to meet a girl. Well, I guess they thought it'd cause less suspicion that way. Yeah, I can buy that, but, uh, what if something happens if we get into trouble? Don't worry about me. I'm really an expert skin diver. And I teach judo. A few hours later, we were on our way to cover what Sumner described as a few square miles of ocean floor. A handy job in anybody's language. Five minutes later, the search was on. The ocean floor is an erratic place. Sometimes flat, sometimes almost uh, mountainous. Every inch of it had to be covered. And up to now, the detector remained as quiet as a tomb. In the excitement, we didn't notice an outboard motorboat riding the waves about a mile from us. There were three fishermen in the boat. Or were they fishermen? They're still submerged. The woman is on the deck waiting for him. Wait a moment. Ah, yes. The man is starting to surface now. To cover the most territory in the shortest possible time, we were alternating our dives. The area kept getting wider and further from shore. Good luck, huh? In the meantime, I discovered that Kathy was no novice at skin diving. came the reward of patience and perseverance. The detective picked up a faint ticking noise which answered a lot of questions. Kathy's instructions were to surface if she got a reaction on the detective. And Kathy knew how to obey instructions. I got a faint signal 
Well, about 50 yards east of here. Good, good. I'll get out and find it and tie on a marker buoy. Yeah. Now you watch for the buoy and bring the boat over to me, huh? All right. The man is apparently getting ready to make another dive in the same spot. This could be what we're waiting for. Let's get within striking distance. The detector turned out to be a honey. A few feet in the wrong direction and it pulls you right back. Finally, it led me right to the nose cone of the missile, straight as a homing pigeon. a handy thing to have around in a case like this. Just tie it to some object and release it. It'll surface and permanently identify your location. Pinned to the ocean bottom with 6,000 pounds of metal across my legs. But Kathy had no way of knowing that I was pinned solidly to the ocean floor. I wasn't even sure whether or not my legs were broken. Kathy spotted the marker buoy and brought the lock over to it. But she had no way of knowing that I was solidly pinned to the floor of the ocean with only about 10 minutes of air left in my tanks. Now they're both submerged. Well, now we should go then. Yes, keep going. I signaled Kathy that I had about three minutes of air left in my tank. She signaled back that her tank was full. The three minutes of air in my tank would give Kathy time to get to the surface. It would give me more time to try and free myself. So we exchanged tanks. There's the marker, boy. My two sets of bubbles. Marky, I think you'd better get aboard their boat in case of emergency. Take us over there. I signaled Kathy to surface and bring down a crowbar. It looked like my only chance.
In her anxiety to help me, Kathy didn't notice the men in the outboard motorboat. This man found that it would take some doing to bring Kathy back to the boat when she almost broke his wrist with a crowbar. He just managed to fasten the crowbar to the marker boy line before she turned to fight off the two men. The crowbar slid down the marker boy line and landed on the ocean floor, but uh, just out of my reach. She put up a real good fight. But finally, with one man hanging to each arm, she was forced to give up. Bring her here! I knew that something must have happened to Kathy, or she would have brought the crowbar down herself and given me a hand. be childish about this. You must understand we have a job to do and we intend to do it. You have located the nose cone, have you not? The main question seems to be what right do these men have to drag me aboard your boat? Mr. Nelson is down there, isn't he? Down where? Down there. Obviously somebody is or there wouldn't be those bubbles. All right, I'll tell you the truth. Mr. Nelson is down there. But he's in trouble. If you let me put on my diving gear, I can go down and help him. Then if you have any questions, maybe he can answer them for you. How deep is he? About 120 feet. Can you dive to that depth? No. Well? I feel better with you on the surface. And Mr. Nelson unaware that we're waiting for him. I think we just sit tight for a while and see what happens. can't stay down there indefinitely. What are you going to do about it? Well, you can't just let him die. On land, it would have been impossible for me to move the nose cone from the awkward position that I was in. But water gives any object a certain buoyancy. And I had to get that nose cone off my legs or else. My legs were practically numb, but there were no broken bones. Now, the big question was, what was happening on the surface? About 40 feet, I could see the bottom of a small boat riding the surface near the marker buoy. 
and all of a sudden, Kathy's failure to come down and help me made sense. It was then that I remembered Sumner had said the nose cone must not fall into the wrong hands. And the thought occurred to me that if some unfriendly group was waiting for me at the surface, my air bubbles would classify me as a sitting duck. So I tied my diving lung to the marker buoy line and set the valve to allow a little leakage. Then it was up to me to make the surface in one breath. The men were so busy watching the bubble that they didn't notice me climbing aboard my boat. The best answer to this problem was my shark gun. Anymore, throw him overboard. Mm. Kathy, how much gasoline they got? Pretty low, Mike. <laughs> Come on aboard, Kathy. Good job, Kathy. There. Thank you. Keep them covered. I'm going to make a little call. X-223, the happy friend. X-223, the happy friend. This is happy friend. Go ahead, X-223. Location 13 miles west of Heston Light, outside of all territorial waters. Project X-223 in operation. Three men in a small boat drifting out to sea will need help. And investigation. Over. Over and out. While the outboard motorboat was slowly drifting towards the setting sun, we set out to complete our job. When we went down again to bring up the tip of the nose cone, it was a mighty comforting feeling to know that when we got to the surface, we'd find a United States destroyer waiting for us, and not three gentlemen who used bullets for bait. Bridges, inviting you to join us for another act story of underwater adventure one week from today.